Welcome to the third in a series of webinars dealing with some of the concerns in and around our local area. This webinar is on spring birding and our moderator is Carter Dorsch, the new executive director of Kensington Conservancy and an authority on birds of all seasons. If you have attended the previous webinars, you may appreciate how well organized and informative they are. And I'm sure this night's will be equally as entertaining. Thank you, Carter, for educating us tonight and I'll let you begin now. Perfect, thanks, Alice. Um, if you just wanna keep an eye on the um, people coming in there. I will do so and I Perfect. will mute. Perfect, thank you. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Glad to see that we got a pretty good turnout. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here and get the presentation up. Perfect. Okay, I'm sure everyone can see my screen there, no problem. Um, so again, welcome. And tonight I'm gonna to be talking to you about spring birding. So as many of you know, birds are one of my passions. I spend a lot of my free time bird watching, mostly in the um, Echo Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Deborah area. And I admit this is a very broad topic. There is a lot of information when it comes to birding, especially in the spring when it's the busiest time of the year bird-wise. So I'm gonna cover a few topics and then I'm hoping at the end we'll open up to questions and anyone can ask anything that I didn't cover. So there's a lot of new faces here who may not know much about the Kensington Conservancy and what we do. So I was just gonna give a quick little rundown. The Kensington Conservancy is a nonprofit charitable organization that uh, protects over 900 acres of ecologically sensitive land in the St. Joseph Channel area. If you're not familiar, the St. Joseph Channel is um, an area just east of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Um, we, our area is kind of the north half of St. Joseph Island, the Deborah area, the Pine Island, and Nebush Island area. In addition to protecting ecologically sensitive land, we conduct stewardship projects within our communities. We promote good environmental practices, mostly through education, especially with our youth. And we are funded nearly 100% through private donations. Um, we do not receive any regular government funding at all, except for grants that we apply for, for our special projects. And we have a membership, which is only $35 a year. So if you're interested, you can become a member of the Kensington Conservancy. So tonight's presentation, I'm going to give a quick little introduction to birding for those of you who have never um, experienced birding at all before. I'm gonna talk about some birds that you can expect to find in our area. I'm gonna talk about some unusual species that you could watch for that do show up every year, but are considered rare. Um, some information on where to go birding, both generalized habitat based on habitat and in our local area some additional tips and tricks, and then we're gonna have a question period. So what is birding? The, def the dictionary definition is birding is the observation of birds in their natural habitats as a hobby. So basically if you're outdoors and you're looking at a bird, you can consider that birding. You can take it as seriously as you want. Um, someone like me who chases rare birds, tries to get as many birds as I can within a year, within given areas. I keep a life list. Um, I, you know, spend a lot of my free time birding or you can take it as casually as you want. If you just note whatever birds you see as you're doing your normal day-to-day -day activities or somewhere in between. Really, you don't need anything to go birding. If you have, um, if you're outdoors, you can listen and watch for birds and you don't need anything. So it uh, is pretty easy to do. But there are some things that can enhance your birding experience. The big one, which I'm sure most of you know, is binoculars. They will help you see birds that are further away because mostly, usually birds are pretty small and hard to see with the naked eye. Binoculars, there's like thousands of different 
brands and varieties. It all really comes down to personal preference. I get recommend people ask me all the time for recommendations on what binoculars to get, but it's so hard to answer. Um, cheap binoculars generally aren't the best, but you know, can work. Sometimes you got to pay $150, $200 to get a good pair of binoculars, but like anything, you could spend thousands of dollars on them. A uh, field guide is, um, especially if you're learning birds, is uh, pretty important. You, if you're looking at birds, you usually want to know what you're looking at. Next is camera. This is definitely not necessary, but a lot of people, oops, sorry. Um, a lot of people enjoy taking pictures of what they see. And if you don't know what a bird is, it's easy to take a picture and then figure it out afterwards. Spotting scope. These um, are basically super binoculars that stand on tripods on their own. And they're really good for watching um, birds that are a great distance if they're, you know, well off the road in the back of a field or hawks high up in the sky, spotting scope can uh, really help you out. Again, these, uh, you know, can be expensive, um, the cost of money, but you can get a, you know, cheap but usable um, scope for a few hundred dollars. And this is probably the least um, important, but can be helpful if you're wanting to learn your bird calls, you can get a variety of audio recorders to record the songs and calls that you hear. Even just a cell phone can work if the bird's close enough. Most cell phones have um, audio recording apps. So field guides, again, there's a ton of varieties, but there's three that I like to consider the big three that um, it comes down to personal preference, which one you like the best, but these ones work um, the best in my opinion. The Sibley Field Guide to Birds, Peterson Field Guide to Birds of North America and the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds of North America. Both of these, or all three of these field guides um, come in two varieties, or three varieties, one for Eastern North America, one for Western North America, and then one for all of North America in one. There's a lot of birds in here, I admit, so it can be overwhelming at first, but these three field guides have the best information. There are lots of other options too. A quick Google search will bring up all kinds of field guides. And if you're someone who likes using apps, there are a variety of field guides online as well, which can be convenient if you just wanna store something on your phone. Merlin, it is um, created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and it, um, it's a pretty good field guide. And it also has a feature that you can um, upload a photo and it gives you a pretty good idea of what it is using um, AI technology. Sibley Birds Volume 2, it's um, basically the same as, you know, the same information that's in the field guide. Um, it does cost money, but I think it's well worth it. Audubon Field Guide, iBird Pro are two. Um, Audubon's free, iBird might, I think has a free and a paid version. And BirdNet is another app from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And it can actually, if you record a call, it can do the same thing as Merlin in pictures. It can give you a good idea of what it is. So there's a lot of birds worldwide. There is over 10,500 of them. And in North America, we have just over 2,000 ourselves. Canada, almost 700. And in the United States, there's almost 1,200. Ontario has... Um, I think the list now is just over 500, but um, on eBird, there's 500 species. Here in the Algoma District, 336 have been recorded. Um, and then within the TKC's focal area, I have data for 225 species, 164 of which have been recorded actually on our nature preserves. So as you can see, there are a lot of bird species out there. There's a lot to learn. Um, it can be overwhelming at times, but... Um, yeah, it goes to show there's a lot of birds. A lot of, you know, people are surprised by how many there are locally. Some people can only, you know, name a few birds and they're amazed that, you know, 200, 250-ish get seen every year here. So I'm just gonna go through um, just a few groups of birds and just kind of show you what birds you could expect to find around here. And even if you're not from here, this um, is kind of, the same birds you would find anywhere in the um, northeastern United States or elsewhere in Canada. 
So here there's um, one, two, six, um, eight, nine, 24 species of common species of waterfowl that we can find around here. Snow goose, Canada goose, tundra swan. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with them, but then there's a variety of ducks too. Um, on this list from wood duck to green wing teal, these are consid considered dabbling ducks. And then from redhead to red breast from merganser on the list, those are diving ducks. They dive underneath the water to um, get food. So a lot of people I'm sure see a lot of Canada geese and mallards and might be surprised how many other ducks there are. Here's a few photos. Oh, just, I was gonna mention all these photos um, in this presentation are ones I've taken myself. And uh, most of them are from the local area here in the um, corner, bottom corner, each one has the species labeled. But here's a, just a big family of Canada geese that was at the viewing platform in um, Deborah at the high school last summer. Northern shoveler, these are really cool dabbling ducks. One of my favorite, look at that big, uh, huge beak on it. Um, no wonder it got the name shoveler. And then hooded merganser. These are, uh, this is a male and they look pretty cool with their, uh, their hood up. So raptors, these are one of, this is one of my favorite families of birds. These are birds of prey that eat other birds or um, mammal, small mammals or forage on any kind of dead food they can find. Um, turkey vultures, ospreys, um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with them. Golden eagle is um, actually, they migrate through here and they can be hard to find, but if you know what to look for, um, they're really cool birds. I actually saw one this afternoon between um, work and uh, getting ready for the presentation tonight. And um, then you got your occipiters, sharp shimmed hawk, cooper's hawk, goshawk. These are fast flying birds that can weave their way through forests, no problem chasing after little songbirds. Bald eagle, um, everyone loves bald eagles. They're beautiful looking, majestic like birds that like um, stealing from other birds and eating at garbage dumps. <laughs> and then we have our budios, um, red-shouldered hawk, rod-winged hawk, red-tailed hawk, rough-legged hawk. Then we get into our owls. In the spring, there's um, six owls that we can expect to see locally. Great horned owl, snowy owl, barred owl, long-eared owl, short-eared owl, and northern sawwood owl. There's three other owls that are found here but are kind of hit and miss and really only seen in the winter time. Those are great gray owl, northern hawk owl, and boreal owl. And then we have our three falcon species, which are American kestrel, merlin, and peregrine falcon. Here's a red-shouldered hawk. Here's, it's not the best quality of photo, but I really like this one. It's a great horned owl hiding behind a branch. All I could see were its eyes and its ear tufts. This was a, by the St. Joseph Island Bridge a couple of years ago. And then this is an immature peregrine falcon, the world's fastest species. I think it's something like 300 kilometers an hour that they can get up to as they're diving after prey. Really cool bird. So then sparrows, a lot of people like referring to them as little brown jobs because that's for the most part, they're little, they're brown and can be hard to tell apart. Um, as you see, we have a variety of species here in the Algoma area. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that dark-eyed junco, despite not having the name sparrow in its name, is as, just as much a sparrow as the rest of them. Um, they actually look very different too, but when you look at the side, the shape of them, they definitely look like a sparrow. This is a clay-colored sparrow. And here we have, as I mentioned, the dark-eyed junco. This one's got a little bug in its um, beak there. So warblers, this is um, one of many people's favorite family groups. Warblers are small little songbirds that can be very pretty, which is um, what makes them attractive. And for the most part, they all have wonderful songs to hear in the spring. Um, we have about 25 species locally that um, we can see each spring. I'm not gonna name them all off here, but um, it's great going into a forest in mid-May and just hearing it alive with warblers singing left and right. Um, this is an oven bird. 
They're, um, if you're not familiar with Ovenberg, you probably definitely heard them before. If you go look up their song, it's a very familiar um, sound in the forest. And here is American red start. This is a male. Um, the thing about warblers is they can be tricky to ID because sometimes the males and females look very different or in the fall when they're in non-breeding plumage, they look very different, um, but they're a lot of fun to learn. So I'm just gonna go through quickly a few other bird species that um, I think they're not ones that most people might not, they're ones most people might not know about, but can be pretty common around here, gray catbird. Um, their call sounds pretty similar to a cat. I've actually heard them before in places where I would expect a cat to be, and like, oh, is there a cat there? And nope, it was a gray cat bird. So no wonder it got its name. Cedar waxwing. Um, these birds can be pretty ab abundant in the summer months, forming flocks, eating berries. Um, Sandhill cranes. This is a, um, you know, I like to call them. Uh, real life pterodactyls. They kind of look like a pterodactyl and they sound like a dinosaur would, you, or we imagine one would. Um, big birds, they like fields and especially in the spring and fall migration right here in the Denver area, there can be thousands of them in the fields. Indigo bunting, this is a really popular bird. Um, not my best photo of one, but you see it's a bright blue bird, which uh, makes it really cool. And, um, they're actually pretty uh, abundant around here. Um, if you learn their call, you might be able to uh, pick them out e more easily. And American bittern. These are uh, wetland birds that are often heard but not seen. They have a really unique, I don't know if I can imitate it, unk -unk type call that you can hear from the wetlands. And uh, they actually have a uh, it's not quite shown it on this photo, but um, their neck is a uh, streaky brown that helps them um, blend in with the cattail reeds and other stuff in the wetlands. So when they think that, you know, feel threatened, they'll stand straight up with their neck up trying to blend in. And this is what this one was trying to do, but it didn't realize it was in the middle of an open field. So it was very easy to see. And lastly, we got yellow bellied sapsucker. This is a woodpecker species, and uh, they're the ones that make those little tiny holes all in a row in um, various trees. They do that and drain the sap. And then it's actually pretty smart. Then bugs will go be attracted to the um, sap in the holes, and then the, the sap suckers will come back and eat those bugs. Um, these guys um, like finding metal to drum on. A lot of people think that uh, they're you know stupid and trying to get insects from the metal, but they're actually doing that because it amplifies their drumming louder, which lets other um, males know that that's their territory and hopefully attracts females for them. So unusual species to watch for, rare bird alert. Um, as I said earlier, in the Algoma district, 336 species have been seen here, but each year we only get about 240 to 260 species. So there's a lot of rare birds that have shown up sometimes once, sometimes a couple of times, but sometimes there's rare birds that are expected to show up every year, but are still exciting to see. So I'm gonna, I have uh, a list of 10 of them that I'm gonna just talk about briefly here. I got a photo for each one. Ross's goose. This is kind of like a miniature snow goose. Um, it looks very similar, but side by side, um, Ross's goose is noticeably smaller. They have a shorter beak. They have no or very little of a green patch, which is um, the line on their bill there. And they have a rounder, you know, cuter head is how a lot of people describe it. Um, Ross's geese, they're, they um, are, can be pretty abundant, like kind of from Texas, north through the prairies where they go up to the Arctic for their breeding. But um, a few of them migrate up through Ontario. Um, so we're kind of on the east edge of their expected range. That's why I only get a few of them. You can find them mixed in with big Canada geese flocks in the fields and um, during the spring and fall. Another goose that um, migrates up through the middle of the continent, but um, we get a few of them through here is the greater white fronted goose. Um, people also call them um, 
speckle bellies um, because of that black marking on their bellies. Um, you see they have an orange bill, orange feet, and are more uh, brown in color. Same kind of idea, you can watch for these within big flocks of migrating Canada geese in the spring and fall. Ready duck. This is a this is a male here. It's uh, pretty interesting looking with its blue bill and uh, black and white head on a nice reddish brown body. Um, we're they kind of breed in the prairies and then they do winter in southern Ontario, but we're just not really in their migratory path for whatever reason. But we still do get the odd one, so it's uh, exciting to see every year. Not every year personally, but usually a few show up. Lesser blackback gull. Unfortunately, I didn't have a great photo that showed the black back of it, but this is uh, originally a European species um, that has over the years just their populations have exploded in North America and they're being found all over the place, um, moving further and further inland. And uh, you can often see these birds in the spring in flocks of ring-billed gulls in the fields where they uh, eat away at insects and whatnot. American white pelican. This is uh, another one. I have lots of favorite birds, but this is one of them. Um, they are another prairie species for the most part, but in recent years, um, they have established pretty good breeding populations in the Thunder Bay area. And it's been a while now that they've been in the Lake of the Woods, Rainy River area. So during spring migration, we usually see a few flocks of them flying overhead on their way um, to those areas. And uh, so, yeah, if you've never seen an American white pelican before, um, you'll be amazed for sure when you see your first one. They're super cool birds. Great egret. Um, so this is, you know, similar to a great blue heron. Um, but as you see, they're all white and have a yellow bill there on black, with black legs. There are southern species. Um, you can find them quite commonly in southern Ontario. And even now in the up or the lower peninsula, but uh, of Michigan, but just south of the Mackinac Bridge, there's some pretty good populations. And um, so sometimes they, you know, wander a little too far north and are found in this area. They're probably actually expanding their range northward, um, likely due to climate change, as I mean, many species are. Um, so maybe someday we'll see them more often than we do right now. Eastern pohi. This is another species found fairly um, common in southern Ontario, um, but sometimes they overshoot their migration and show up here. And another thing that could be expanding their range northward with climate change. This is actually a type of sparrow, um, another one that doesn't actually have sparrow in its name, but it's a lot bigger than our normal sparrows, um, about double the size or so. Um, Western metal lark. This one, from the photo, you, it's really hard to tell the difference between this and an eastern meadowlark, which is the expected species for our area. But um, they do show up here. Usually, they're, uh, if there's a really early meadowlark or a really late meadowlark, it's a um, good chance that it's a vagrant western meadowlark. They have a, the best way to differentiate them from an eastern meadowlark is by their song. Um, Yellow-headed blackbird. Its name is pretty self-explanatory. It's a blackbird with a yellow head. Um, these are super cool birds. They have quite the song. It's um, some people might not enjoy it at all. It's probably not music to most people's ears, but um, they're a prairie species that sometimes um, one gets mixed in with a flock of red-winged blackbirds and grackles and migrates through here. And the last one is golden-winged warbler. Um, this is a species at risk in Ontario, actually. And um, again, we're at the north end of their range, but even though populations are declining rapidly for this species due to habitat loss and other factors, I'm sure, um, they can be found in this area and actually breeding. We found a few populations of them last summer. So now that I've given you kind of a quick or not so quick rundown on the birds that can be found in area. I'm gonna 
talk about where you can go to find some birds yourself this spring. So first I'm gonna talk about some generic habitats um, where I kind of list everything here because the truth is you can find birds wherever you go outside. Um, especially in spring migration, there's going to be birds everywhere you look. But some of the best places to go to and target are um, fields. Um, there's a lot of grassland birds, sparrows, um, meadowlarks, bobolinks, um, northern harriers like um, hunting in fields. But um, in the spring, if the fields are flooded, waterfowl will concentrate there. Um, Canada geese and then potential for those rare geese species and then all kinds of ducks can be found in those fields and often fairly close to roads which make for good viewing. Um, wetlands, kind of a no-brainer. Everyone knows that wetlands are great habitat for a variety of um, plants and wildlife. So birds um, will often be found there. Forests. Um, on a nice, warm, sunny spring morning, at the crack of dawn, forest will be alive with bird song, as I mentioned earlier. So that's a good spot to find a lot of songbirds that um, nest in trees. Birds um, are often attracted to water, especially if they're waterfowl, but other birds like being along um, the edge of water too. So lakes and rivers can be good spots to um, look. And then in the spring when birds are migrating, that means they're flying overhead. So if you have a location that has a lot of open sky, if you can kind of see 360 or a pretty good view, if you just stand there and watch, you'll probably, if it's a good migration day as in, you know, sunny or, um, you know, the weather's not too bad and the wind's blowing in the right direction, you'll probably see lots of birds flying overhead. So in terms of specific places to go birding, um, there's lots in our area. I've actually created a map called the Algoma District Birding Locations Map, which plots out a whole variety of places that you can go birding within the Algoma District. This is just a, a small screenshot that shows kind of the um, Kensington Conservancy's focal area. The blue dots are just normal birding locations and the red ones are kind of to highlight the good locations, the, you know, the best ones. So I'll, right when we're done the presentation, I'll put a link to this in the chat. Um, it, it's a, like a long link, so it's not easy to just, you know, tell you what it is. Um, but if you miss it in the chat too, feel free to email me and I'll give it to you. But um, yeah, and for those of you though that aren't local and are looking for places to go birding, eBird is a great resource. Um, ebird.org is the website. And if you go to the Explore um, page and then the Explore Hotspots page, it brings up a map of all the birding locations that various birders have created throughout the world. And uh, you can kind of, on the zoomed out version, the darker the red, the colors are the more species have been seen there, which makes sense the further south and along the coast. But if you zoom in, this is Toronto I've zoomed into. You see there's a ton of locations. And if you click on each one, it gives you a name of what the park or um, you know, just location in general is called and it'll give you a link to the list of species seen there. Um, so no matter where you are, if you take advantage of eBird, you can find some good birding locations near you. Back to my map that I created for the local area, each one of those points, if you click on it, it brings up a description of um, what it is and where it is and some information. So for example, I've clicked on the one here for the Kensington Conservation Center and the Foster Parkland Walking Trails. It gives a brief rundown on our bird feeders here and the hiking trails and some links to more information. So most burning locations on this map have some information. Some I haven't, you know, it's a lot of work, so I haven't uh, totally updated them, but it's a good resource. So I'm going to just talk about a few right in our, you know, the popular spots. The Portlock Flats, which is just east of the Kensington Conservation Center in Deborah here. Um, Government Road is the main road that people go um, drive along to bird in this area. But it is, you know, a lot of agricultural fields, which attract a, a great variety of um, 
you know, raptors hunting the field, sparrows, as I mentioned, bobblings, eastern meadowlarks, um, American kestrels in the spring and fall, the fields flood, bringing waterfowl, shorebirds even will come into the, um, into the flooded fields there. The, very, the best, uh, not the best maybe, but kind of a specialty bird that are found in the Portlock Flats every year is the Brewer's Blackbird. This is a, another Western species that just so happens that their natural range um, comes into the Algoma district here. So, and a lot of people in Southern Ontario um, don't get Brewer's Blackbird, so they're excited to see them when they come here. They're, I mean, not the um, most exciting bird by looking at them. They're, you know, like uh, kind of similar to a common grackle or a rusty blackbird, but uh, they got a nice purplish sheen to them and they have a unique call, which is kind of cool. One, this is definitely my absolute favorite birding location is the St. Joseph Island Migratory Bird Sanctuary, which shares the same boundaries as Fort St. Joseph National Historic Site. Um, just this, the southern tip of St. Joseph Island. Um, so a lot of birds, when they're crossing the water, this is where they land first at first sight of land. And then it has a variety of habitats like um, the water, obviously, wetlands, forest, up at the ruins, some kind of not, it's not fields, but open area to get a wide variety of species. Um, so yeah, it, it's a fantastic place to find birds. And no wonder it was designated as a migratory bird sanctuary. Um, this is a Lapland longspur, which is a bird that breeds up in the Arctic, but migrates through here every year. Um, they're pretty, you know, pretty reliable to see them during, especially fall migration up at the ruins at, of Fort St. Joseph. And here's a barred owl. Um, these are the, you know, a common sound of the forest in the springtime. Um, they go, they're the ones who goes, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Um, that's the kind of what the name people have given to their hooting. The southern half of St. Joseph Island is by far the most reliable place to find barred owls. There's a pretty high, in this area, it's a pretty high density of them. So um, at, within the Migratory Bird Sanctuary, I've seen lots of owls along the road. Um, one of the other really popular locations is the Sioux Locks and Whitefish Island in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, even if it's not for the birds, it's a fantastic place to go for a hike um, if you've never been. But just as a green space within city, um, the birds, as they're flying over, they see that little green space among all the buildings. So they'll go down there. Plus the variety of habitats, wetland, open grass area, forest, it uh, attracts a lot of birds during migration. And uh, this is a black crown night heron, which is, um, um, another really cool heron species. All birds are really cool. I can't stop saying it, but um, this is a kind of a specialty bird of Whitefish Island. They, you can see them elsewhere within the area, but for some reason, most of them seem to go and breed here. Um, this one here is on the Echo Bay viewing, viewing platform, but I just wanted to highlight the Echo Bay and Bar River area in general. Um, the viewing platform at Echo Bay is um, within this, you know, huge magnificent wetland that has a vast variety of wetland species. But Echo Bay in general, um, there's the Looney Boardwalk, there's the, um, that wetland right off the side of, at the corner of Church Street and uh, Highway 17, which tracks a lot of birds. And then if you go down the, at the bottom of the map there, the Bar River Flats, which is in um, a bunch of fields that have a lot of cool birds as well. So that whole, the whole Echo Bay um, Bar River area is great for birding. This is um, a least bittern. Uh, this is a species at risk in Ontario. And uh, it's a really, really small bittern species that is pretty hard to find. They're, they do get seen here every year, but just they're so secretive, it's hard to even hear one, let alone take a picture. So I got lucky with this one. Um, so just quickly, I'm gonna go through some other birding locations in our area. In Bruce Mines, you got the marina and the sewage balloons, surprisingly, are um, attract a lot of ducks and shorebirds in the spring. 
Tesla and you got the Marina Lighthouse Point is, you know, a nice point that goes out into the water. So a lot of migrating birds land there first. There's some various parks along the water and um, sewage lagoons there as well. View down Pumpkin Point Road in Laird Township, there's a viewing platform near the end that is also in a really fantastic wetland. And then the park at the end gives you a view out into the open water where there's usually lots of ducks. Um, in addition to the St. Joseph Island Migratory Bird Sanctuary, St. Joseph Island itself just has a lot of great birding locations. The Huron line has, um, I think like over 150 species have been seen along there. The Hay Marsh, which, you know, unless you get into a boat, it's really hard to access off the southwest um, end of St. Joseph Island, but another wetland that's very productive. And then there's all the various farm fields that are productive. If you're in Sault Ste. Marie, Fort Creek and Bellevue Park are the two other you know, green spaces within city limits that attract a lot of birds. And anywhere along the waterfront, along the hub trail there, is gives you some good vantage points out into the river and to a lot of birds. And oops, if you're going north of town, even Gooley River, there's a lot of good spots, Batchewano Bay, Lake Superior Provincial Park, all the various trails there. Um, you can get some good birds, especially during breeding season. And then if you make it up to Wawa, there's um, the sewage lagoons there are really good. Um, the road to the dump, you can actually get a lot of boreal type species like blackback woodpecker, Canada jay, boreal chickadee. So um, pretty good birding up there. Everywhere around here, it's good birding. You can't go wrong. So I'm going to, there's so many tips and tricks. I just picked a couple that I'm going to talk about here. But if you go on to um, eBird and you go to the explore page and then to bar charts, it'll give you these bar charts, which are based on data that people have submitted to eBird. And it gives you a good idea of when you can expect to see certain birds. Because, um, you know, birds are migratory, they're not found here year round. And you know, something like a ruby-throated hummingbird, you're never going to see in the winter time. Um, they show up at a certain time every year. Same with the warblers. They, if you look at, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but um, in April, barely any warblers get reported. It's not until the beginning of May when they start showing up. So if you see a warbler in March, either it's super early or maybe you misidentified it. So it's um, good to know when and where you can expect to see birds. They basically follow the same patterns year after year. It's pretty reliable. The next one here is to learn your songs and calls. Um, if you get good at identifying birds visually, um, you know, that can be tough, but it's easy enough to do. Um, but learning your calls will help you, A, know what you're hearing if you can't see it, and it'll help you track it down so that you can see it. This is really tough. There's no easy way to explain how to, um, how, how to teach you to learn this. The best way is to go out in the field and get experience by you know, visually seeing a bird and it calling. And then you just, eventually you'll memorize that. But there's apps out there that um, you know, will play the call so you can practice. There's that app I mentioned, BirdNet, that if you record a sound, it'll identify it for you. Not 100% accuracy, but it's pretty good. Um, and then if you upload sounds to eBird, you can actually get a spectrogram, which shows what the sound looks like. This one here I'm going to play for you is a sedge wren. So I'm pretty sure when I recorded this call, I could not see it anywhere, but I knew it was close and I recorded it. And since I knew what it was, I knew it was a sedgeran. So yeah, just, it takes a long time. It took me years to learn everything. There's, I still don't know everything, all the calls. I'm constantly recording them and looking them up after the fact, but that's one tip I have is to learn your calls and songs. The next one is to learn or to join your local birding or naturalist club. If you're looking to get out and you know learn where to go birding, 
or looking to learn more about birds or just get out with other people, um, your local birding or naturalist club is a great resource for that. Here in Sault Ste. Marie, we have the Sioux Naturalists. They typically, not right now because of COVID, but they have weekly outings, not always bird focused, but a lot of them are, especially in the spring and fall migration. So that's a great resource, you know, to join up, meet some like-minded people and learn and get out birding. Um, and then the Kensington Conservancy. We're, we're not like a naturalist club or anything, but we do do um, in a typical year, a lot of public events like bird watching or um, looking for other types of nature. So if you, you know, become a member of the Kensington Conservancy or stay up to date with our emails, then hopefully, hopefully this spring we'll, I'll be able to lead some birding hikes. I'm not 100% um, sure I'll be able to do that given the COVID situation, but we'll try. And yeah, if you're, uh, if you're not local, if you're somewhere else, um, chances are that there will be some sort of naturalist club or birding club in your area. A quick Google search would probably bring that up. My next tip is to don't be afraid to ask someone for help. In my experience, um, nobody will get mad at you for asking for help. If you don't know how to identify a bird or you're looking for any kind of help, um, especially me, like I, I'm, I'm busy. I might not get back to you right away, but I'm always happy to help people identify their birds or any other information they need about birding. Um, and the one thing, if you make a mistake, you know, don't feel bad. Everyone makes mistakes. Even the most experienced birders are constantly learning. I, uh, I miss ID birds all the time. No, not too often publicly or anything like that. But when I'm by myself, I'll see something, think that's what it is. And then realize, oh, nope, it's this. I usually, you know, catch myself pretty quickly, but um, you know, everyone makes mistakes. I make a lot less than I used to, but um, even the most experienced birders are always making mistakes. That's just part of it. And if you're someone who's on Facebook, there's a variety of Facebook groups that are related to birding. Um, I run one called Agomagistic Birding, which is for local content. But each you know, area, whether it be a state or province, typically has their own birding group on Facebook. And then there's like general birding groups. The American Birding Association runs two groups, one called What's This Bird, where you can upload a photo of a bird and someone will tell you what it is. And then they have a group called ABA Birds and Birding. That is just kind of a general group for anything birding related that people can post and discuss about. And my last tip and trick, tip and tricks is to have fun. Um, don't take it too seriously, you know, enjoy it. And that's what this is all about is having fun. So that's my tip. Um, just before we wrap up, I'm gonna give a plug for our next webinar, which is taking place in a month from now at the end of April. It's going to be all about outdoor activities that kids can get involved in this spring. So watch for that. I will open up registration. I might not get to it tomorrow. So um, early next week for sure. And if you wanna make sure you stay up to date on when registration opens, you can sign up for our email list, which it can be, Found on our website kensingtonconservancy.org slash subscribe or you can also if you just go to our website kensingtonconservancy.org there's a little um, spot to do that on the home page. So that's the end of my actual presentation tonight. I'm going to open it up to um, questions in a minute here. My contact info is on this on the screen there. The office self my office number the cell my cell number and my email address. And I just want to talk quickly about this painted bunting. One really exciting thing about birding is, in my opinion, is when rare birds show up. And this is a rare, really rare one that showed up a couple springs ago in Sault Ste. Marie. Obviously a very colorful, beautiful bird. And that is normally found in like uh, Florida. And I think a little bit in Alabama, maybe South Carolina, but it's a pretty Southern bird that it is known to wander North, but it was really cool to see. So that is, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. And um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, I'll try to answer them as best as I can.
Uh, you said you were going to post uh, those maps. Whereabouts are you going to post them? Yeah, I'll uh, um, just go copy it right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll post it into the chat box. Um, okay. Which you should be able at the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat option. One second here. Okay, I got it. Okay. There, I just sent to a, a link to it now. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. So if anyone um, needs that link in the future, just shoot me an email. Um, you all should have my email address because I sent you the um, link for tonight's webinar through my email. So if you, if you lose it, just uh, let me know and I'll resend you that link. Oh, question here in the mess in the chat about the St. Joseph Island Migratory Bird Sanctuary. So yeah, the gate is closed um, when the park isn't open. Um, so you have to either walk or bike in from the gate um, when it's not open in the off season. Any other questions? Come on, I was expecting lots. <laughs> I have a question about the uh, sharp tail grouse. Okay, yeah. Where can you find them? Where, where, find where them? can you find them? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, so they're around. Um, a lot, like, it's good to look in agricultural fields that have, um, you know, bush nearby. But they're they're tricky. It's they're um, unreliable, even in spots where they're known to be. Um, on any given day, it's hard to track one down. I see them often enough, but that's probably just because I always have my eyes and ears open. Um, the one best spot, though, to look is on Rydal Mill Road between Government and McLennan Road. If you go down there on the, I guess that would be the north side of the road. There's a little uh little hill and they're in the spring they'll lek there with lek is kind of their the name for their breeding group that they get in and all dance around that's the most reliable spot but even then unless you're there early morning or sometimes they're just not there it's they're really cool species but yeah they're hard to track down but if you if you spend enough time in suitable habitat in this area you should eventually run across them they're easier to see in the winter time when they're up on the snow in the fields in this, you know, once you get into summer, the fields are, you know, really tall and they blend right in. They're hard to see. Are there, um, I can get on here. Just wanted to ask you, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, where might you find uh, tundra swans at this time of year? Or, or, or later. Yeah, so tundra swans, um, any open water, really. Um, right now, a lot of water is opening up, but they're still, you know, some of it's still frozen. Um, but they basically any open water, you can find them. But they also enjoy flooded fields. So if you go to, so let's say, the Bar River area or the Portlock Flats area, if there's flooded fields and a lot of waterfowl, um, the tundra swans will go into there as well. In Bar River, especially, there's been days where there's been over a hundred tundra swans in the fields all together. It's pretty neat to witness. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Carter, I, I have to sign off. Uh, very, um, Oh, I froze. Carter. Yeah, I froze there for a second. <laughs> Can you hear me? 